very much. Can you all hear me? Um, okay, great. The mic's working. So I'm Nero Sri Wardner. Really delighted uh, to speak to you. It's a, a pleasure to talk to you about our uh, research on sleep. And I'm really delighted that Helen Todd is joining me. So Helen, do you want to just uh, say a big hello? And, uh, Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm Mike. Can I put that down? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Helen and I are going to talk uh, a little bit about our sleep research. I I'm a GP by background. I, I was trying to figure out how I could mention every previous talk that's gone on today because everybody sleeps, obviously. Uh, we're, 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 we spend a third of our lives sleeping, uh, and it's surprising that. Um, doctors, nurses don't know a little bit more about how to manage sleep problems. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing to try and improve sleep management in primary care. Um, I've got a fantastic team here at the University of the Community and Health Research Unit. So these are the folk who do most of the work. Um, and I come and just talk to you. So, so, so that's great. Um, uh, everybody sleeps. All animals sleep. You know, giraffes sleep a couple of hours a night. Um, brown bats at the other end sleep 22 hours out of 24. Uh, I sleep about seven or eight. Uh, this is my grandson who uh, at that time, you know, one month old, uh, he was sleeping around 14, 15 hours uh, each, each night. Uh, so it's essential. We know that sleep is essential for well-being. Uh, it, lack of sleep, or in fact too much sleep, is associated with cardiovascular mortality. It doubles your mortality if you sleep uh, less than five hours. Uh, poor sleep is associated with obesity. There you go, a link with obesity. <laughs> Type 2 diabetes, hypertension. Um, it's uh, associated with problems with the immune system if you don't sleep properly. So it's really essential. And um, we, we know a lot more about why we sleep uh, and, and how we sleep linked to various hormonal changes that are going on throughout the day and in relation to light. So hormones like erectin, um, like melatonin, uh, are, are released at various times of the day. You get a build-up of a substance called adenosine uh, in the hypothalamus, which increases your sleep pressure. and. Uh, David Mullineau, who I was speaking to earlier, uh, has a very small child, and his, his adenosine levels are very high, which means he's uh, uh, often wanting to sleep because his, his little ones keep him up at night. Um, so, uh, what about insomnia in primary care? It's incredibly common. It affects 30 to 50% of the population. 10% of adults have in chronic insomnia, long-term insomnia, Around about 50% of sufferers see general practice, and about half of us, um, half of those who see GPs get a prescription for a sleeping tablet. 25%, um, one in four of over 65s, are taking a sleeping tablet regularly or intermittently. If you go to Belgium, it's 50%, so one in two. And um, we know that these drugs are over-prescribed in general practice. Um, we know that some drugs like uh, Valium, they're reducing in prescribing, but the newer drugs, Z drugs, uh, are actually increasing. So we spend about 20, 25 million pounds a year on, the, on around about 10 million pre prescriptions of these sleeping tablets each year. And around about 20 years ago, when I started doing this work, a local colleague of mine came and said, Nero, you know that uh, sleeping tablet uh, prescribing in Lincolnshire is one of the highest in the country and can I do something about it? So I said, well, well I'll, I'll try, we'll start to have a look at it. Um, one of the things we did a few years ago was to look at where the sleeping tablets worked and I worked with Irving Kirsch, who's at Harvard, and said to him, I wonder whether sleeping tablets uh, are, are really placebos. And we looked at the data from the Food and Drugs Administration in the US and this is a paper published in BMJ. And what we found was that the evidence on sleeping tablets, these newer Z drugs that have been prescribed, uh, only added 22 minutes of sleep on a polysomnograph and seven minutes of additional sleep subjectively. So, so they don't really add very much to your sleep. Um, 
Worse than that, sleeping tablets mess up your sleep cycle, uh, so your REM, <coughs> non-REM sleep, and these things are incredibly important. We talked about, uh, we heard about flow earlier today, and one thing, one of the things that wasn't mentioned was how important sleep is for performance, and it's incredibly important both for cognitive and physical performance. Um, we know in terms of sleeping tablets that uh, people over 60 taking a sleeping tablet, maybe seven out of 100 benefit uh, in terms of 20, uh, 20 minutes extra sleep. Uh, around about 17 out of the 100 uh, actually get harms. Uh, that includes road traffic accidents and falls, hip fractures, for example. So the, the harm benefit ratio isn't great for these drugs. When we asked uh, practitioners, this is GPs in Lincolnshire, and what we've tried to do over the years is to engage with the local community to try and answer some of these research questions. What we found was that GPs didn't like prescribing sleeping tablets, but they, they tended for people with sleep problems to prescribe these drugs very readily, and that's partly because they thought certainly these newer drugs were more effective, safer, less li liable to side effects, None of these things is true, but it's the way that the drugs are marketed. Uh, the positive thing was that GPs were, were very uh, open to trying to reduce prescribing and to try uh, psychological treatments for insomnia. When we talked to patients, so we did a survey of Lincolnshire patients, over nine out of 10 are taking these drugs for over four weeks. They're only licensed for two to four weeks. Uh, nine out of 10 advise to continue treatment. Uh, for a month or more, often prescribed by their GP, met most on repeat prescriptions, uh, four out of 10 had side effects, and two out of 10 wanted to stop these things, but couldn't because, uh, as you know, if you try and stop sleeping tablets, you get withdrawal symptoms uh, and withdrawal insomnia. So we worked with local practices. The, the, these are uh, colleagues from eight local general practices to uh, undertake a project called REST, which stands for Resources for Effective Sleep Treatment. So we spent a long time uh, trying to figure out acronyms for our projects. Uh, <laughs> um, um, and the, the aim was to provide effective, safe, non-drug treatment for insomnia, uh, to introduce better sleep assessment, uh, psychological treatments, and hypnotic withdrawal programs, and to get psychological treatments into general practice. And the psychological treatments that I'm talking about are something called cognitive behavioural for insomnia. When you, when you speak to GPs and nurses, they sort of think, well, uh, that sounds incredibly complicated, that's going to be very long-winded. Um, actually, it's dead simple, and both practitioners and patients can, fit, can learn about this themselves in a very, very short period of time. It consists of five techniques. Cognitive, so learning a little bit more about sleep, um, and the behavioural techniques are something called sleep hygiene, uh, sleep uh, uh, stimulus control, which is avoiding stimuli in bed, muscle relaxation, which is a set of techniques that uh, you use to relax muscles, and sleep restriction, which we'll hear a little bit more about in a moment from Helen. Uh, and just by teaching practices how to do that, we had significant falls in their Z drug practice, uh, prescribing, you can see in the blue, those are the eight practices that took, took part in the intervention. And you can see a big drop in their prescribing, and that's continued to go down, uh, actually for two years after we intervened, whereas the eight control practices had uh, increased in prescribing and, and sustained increases afterwards. Um, we, we've moved that out into a further number of practices funded by these Midlands Health and Innovation um, uh, 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 system within, within these Midlands. And so I went out and trained 40 practices using these techniques. Um, but we thought, uh, you know, I can't, I can't go around the country training practices in, in cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia. So we developed uh, an e-learning programme and that's now been used by 20,000 20, people in 160 countries. Um, so it means that this uh, therapy, if you like, is, is, is 
uh, going out wider. But it is, it is not straightforward to implement, although the practices we worked with were able to do this in two 10-minute consultations. And so people are thinking of new ways to intervene uh, in general practice to make it uh, quicker, more efficient. Uh, we're starting to use online therapies. Uh, and these, these treatments are starting to show real, really important effects. So a recent paper that was published in JAMA Psychiatry showed that better sleep with online treatments for sleep actually led to better quality of life, obviously better quality of sleep. Um, surprisingly, university students, <coughs> including some who uh, uh, studied here, took part in another trial uh, uh, published in Lancet Psychiatry, which showed that if you intervene in university students who, are, who had sleep problems, it reduces the chance of uh, psychosis, so hallucinations and delusions. So as well as helping sleep, it prevents psychological and psychiatric problems. And the other thing that we started to think about is briefer therapies uh, used in general practice. So the HABIT trial, uh, we're halfway through. It's a trial of sleep restriction therapy. It's a great idea, isn't it? People uh, come to you, they're not sleeping, and so you say, actually, I'm going I'm to deprive you of your sleep um, to make you sleep better. Uh, and that's a, a 1.8 million trial, pound trial going on with Oxford and Manchester. I'm going to ask Helen to take over and tell you a little bit about your experience of the trial. So thank you. Um, so as Nira said, I'm a practice nurse working at Nestle Net Medical Practice, just up the road from here. Um, it's been my first experience with a, any clinical trial from actually the word go. So I've been involved in one before, um, part of the Garfield tri trial for AF, but I was coerced into the middle of that one, so I never felt like I got my teeth into that one. So it's been really good to start from the beginning of it. Um, so we had a training session, started about a year ago. There was about eight practitioners. Um, all in the room together, none of whom had any experience within sleep restriction therapy um, before. So it was new to all of us, and we were talk about some insomnia, um, the importance of sleep, the building of sleep pressure, and um, why people get into bad habits with their sleep, and also then how to ways in which we can help to correct that and help to put them back onto the right track of sleep and make their sleep better. Um, so the sleep restri restriction therapy aims to improve the efficiency of sleep by restricting the amount of time a person spends in bed actually awake. So we've got my, my part to play with this. We have the patients come in to see me. It's arranged over a four week period. So this first session that I see the patient for is a half an hour session where I go through insomnia, we go through the training slides that were initially given, um, have a look at their sleep habits and what's causing them to, to perhaps not sleep very well and if there's any any element there that we can help with and also just to tell them that it's it is quite hard it's a quite tough tough re regime to stick to and they need to have good willpower and good strength to go behind it prior to actually seeing me they will have um worn a watch and had a sleep diary for a week and julie who's doing all the, the control trial trial side of things as well she then works out how long that person, over an average week, has actually slept for. So they might have been in bed for 10 hours, but out of those 10 hours, they may have only been asleep for five of those hours. So then if that's averaged out of the week, when they come to me, they're given their sleep time, so their sleep window is then averaged out. So they might have five hours, and that's it. That's all they can sleep for the following week. So then I see them. We then work out what time they'd like to get up in the morning is probably the easiest way of doing it. So if someone, say, had a five-hour sleep window, but they needed to be up at seven, we then told them they couldn't go to bed until two o'clock in the morning, which personally I think just sounds horrific, but I do sleep very well, so I'm quite happy with that. Um, but actually, so that's what I'm saying, it's really tough for them to actually take this on board, but so far, going forward, they've been really happy and, and quite happy to go along with this. The one lady in particular I'm thinking about that had the 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. window was one person that actually got the most benefit out of the trial because she was going to sleep at sort of one o'clock in the morning and then waking several times over the course of the night and not actually getting up till 10 o'clock. So her sleep pressure, come by the time she was ready to go back to bed that night, she wasn't actually tired. So exactly the same thing would happen again and she'd lie in bed awake, sleep initially and then wake. So no, by restricting her sleep, making her very tired before she went to bed, she was actually then able to fall into a sleep pan. So that's on week one. We send them away with another diary, tell them how long they can stay in bed for. 
discuss any obstacles that might come in the way of one chap who had his dog's got a very small bladder, so he had to get up many times to go and let the dog out, and his wife snored next to him as well. So that didn't help. So there's certain obstacles we can't change or we can't do anything about. Week two, when we see them, it's just a telephone a consultation, just to follow up, just to see how they've got on, if there's any other problems or if they're getting on okay with it. Talk about driving, obviously, and safety while they're driving and not to drive while they're sleepy. Um, and then, again, do exactly the same again. We look at their sleep pattern for the week, work out their sleep window and work out their sleep efficiency. Now if their sleep efficiency, so the amount of time they've actually been in bed asleep and the amount of time they've been in bed but they're awake, work it out as a percentage. And if that percentage is 85% or more, we can actually let them have a whole other 15 minutes in bed. If that is 80%, they have to stay on the same, whereas if it's gone below 75%, we actually steal another 15 minutes of sleep from them. So that never goes down very well with anybody. So hopefully they'll improve. Um, week three they come back into us again and it's another face-to-face -face consultation and we go through exactly the same thing again, working out their sleep diary, working out their sleep patterns, any problems, and set them off again and off they go until week four. Week four is their final week, they'll come back to me on week four, telephone consultation on week four, um, go through how they've got on. They do another week where they do their restricted sleep patterns and then they're sent away and Julie then follows up at three months and six months and nine months and 12 months in total. So Julie then follows on from that pattern. The question came up for the patient, so after this four week period, what do I do? Do I still have to go to bed at two o'clock in the morning and get up again at seven o'clock in the morning? And the advice Nero gave me on that one was that not to be quite so restrictive, but obviously if they felt that their sleep was slipping back into a bad pattern again, they could then bring it back and, and make their sleep tighter again so that they get better control of it. And say so it's been, where was it, sorry? No, no, <laughs> it's been really well received, but obviously it is, it's the, the time in that paper, people have really struggled with. Um, yeah, being told what time you can go to bed and being told what time you, you have to get up, they've actually, actually struggled with. The ones that have stuck with it have actually found it's very beneficial to them, they found it helpful. So. Helen, thank you so much. And um, what this illustrates is the fantastic work that nurses are, are doing in the general practices <coughs> that. Uh, are working on the trial. Um, we're also, um, Steph Armstrong Ju and Julie Pattinson are doing a process evaluation of this complex, evaluate, uh, complex intervention trial to try and interview nurses and also patients and, and uh, general practitioners to try and figure out um, uh, how, how this whole intervention is working for them. Uh, trying to figure out which ingredients are working well and which, which not, um, uh, so that if, if it works, we can scale it up uh, across other practices. So I'm really grateful to, to um, Helen uh, and the other nurses and practices for working with us. Um, so I just wanted to finish off by thanking <coughs> our collaborators and funders. We're working with a lot of groups uh, in the UK and, and abroad. Um, and thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you.